الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين وسلم التسليم الكثير أما بعد We continue 7.51 p.m. Friday, September 13th, 2019. Which agrees on the Hijri calendar. Well, today is the 14th, 15th actual, and, uh, actually it's the 15th of Muharram. The year 1440 after the migration of the Prophet Wasallam. We continue in this tremendous chapter. Speaking about the different calamities that would befall the, the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu and how the affair of Ghurba or the affair of that strangeness that will happen to this Ummah, meaning the strangers of those who will be in the zaman of corruption or time of corruption, and as you see it becoming or actualizing in front of us brothers and sisters. You'll find the affair of ghurba, of people becoming strangers. And when, we, when we say ghurba, we mean it in a praiseworthy manner of those clinging to what is correct and being upright, righteous people in a time of darkness where it's being piled on one another or compiled upon one another. Dhulumat ba'tuha fawqa ba'd. As you see, a lot of darkness is now taking place all around us not only in the affairs of the dunya we see the non-muslims how their lives are becoming in a state of chaos as we live in times where there's a a rampant number of a lot of lunatics and maniacs and people out there who are losing their minds but also in the affairs of the religion people are becoming strangers as you'll find that the circle of Ahl Sunnah all over the world have been affected by the, the times or the trials and the tribulations and the, and the calamities of fitna in regards to those who creep in the ranks of the Salafis and wear their clothes or come in their cloak or wear their garments and speak how they speak in order to cause confusion and corruption from within. From within. For all these affairs that are taking place is what the Prophet Sallallahu informed in this hadith, all of them. All these different calamities that we see have, that are happening still to this very moment is exactly what the Messenger of Allah informed. It's no, it's no different than what he said, alayhi salatu wasalam. As we continue in our hadith, or the last part was where we concluded, we stopped. After the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, that he spoke about all the different atrocities or calamities that will befall this ummah, as we said that the message of Allah Sallallahu said in the last part giving glad tidings in the Bushra. The glad tidings that there will be a group from his ummah that will stay victorious or they will stay steadfast upon the truth. Granted victory and aid by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and, and no one will harm them who will abandon them meaning not giving them aid when they need it. And even though the people when they say, لا يضره من خذلهم As we talk about <coughs> that no one will harm them who will خذلهم خذلهم as we know خذلان means someone who is from you. As خذلان can happen from someone who's, who is in the same ranks you are. Say that they're Muslim. That they say that they're upon what you're upon. And they, and at the same time, can harm you. And they might abandon you. So that with the word khudlan is talking about those who's from your people. Who could be from you. They could be upon what you're upon, but they might not give you aid at the time when you need it. So it happens. So the word khudlan happens or it applies to those who are upon what you're upon. They say that they're Muslim, and it even can happen from some of your Salafi brothers and sisters. Yes, it can happen. Someone from your own people can let you down. And I give you aid when you need it, when you expect that they're going to aid you, but they don't. 
So it can happen. So the Prophet ﷺ said, despite of this happening or occurring, this still will not harm them. It still won't harm the people the truth. He says, لا يضرهم من خذلهم For those who abandoned them, for those who let them down, for those who did not give them aid when they needed that aid or that help. And no one will harm them who oppose them, as it says in the narration. ولا من خلفهم Well here I think it's narrated, well, maybe it's in my book here, my copy. Here it just says خذلهم, it doesn't say خلفهم. But in the narration, as we know, is authentic. It also mentions in that same narration, they will not be harmed by those who oppose them. So it's not only khudlan for those who let you down and did not give you aid when you need it, that help. Also, this is comprehensive for the meaning of this narration. Wala man khalafahum. Also, those who oppose them until the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes. So that is the narration where we want. That is where we spoke about last lesson. We stopped at this particular love or this wording of the hadith. You'll find that the great Imam Ibn Uthameen that he gives a great little benefit in regards to this narration. The Prophet ﷺ said, There will never cease to be a group of my ummah that upon the truth granted victory. <clears throat> as the Prophet ﷺ, as he mentioned, it says, the great Imam, he says, هَذِهِ لَمْ يُحَدِّدْ مَكَانَهَا فَتَشْمَلُ جَمِيعَ بُقَاعِ الْأَرْضِ فِي الْحَرَمَيْنِ وَالْعِرَاقِ وَغَيْرَهُمَا The Prophet ﷺ, when he mentioned this narration, if you look in your books, everyone, where it talks about, if you look in the wording, where's your book? Well, if you have your book, just share with them. Let's go and sit with them. The Prophet ﷺ in his narration did not specify its place of where this group will be. So being that the case, when the Prophet ﷺ generalized it, that means it's comprehensive for all or every place in this dunya, or in this, on this planet, or on this, on this what? On the earth. Jami'a buqa'il ab. Whether it be in the Haramain, or whether it be in Iraq, or what other, or other than that. So the Prophet ﷺ here is saying that the people, the truth, can be anywhere. Some of them will be in a certain place. Some of them will be in a certain number. Some in a specific time will be in a, sp a specific place. Some of them might be in Morocco or in the West. Some of them might be in the East. Some of them will be in different places and locations. In different locales, of course, or different locations, excuse me. But however, their number might increase in one place and there'll be less in another. That this can happen. Does not mean that they will be plentiful all the time. Sometimes, depending on the time, depending on the place. Some of them could be in abundance or in number, could be or they could be plentiful in a specific place. And then they number, they could be small or few in another, dependent on the time and place. So based upon this narration, the Prophet ﷺ generalized. As the great Imam, he goes on to say, the most important thing is that we know that this group will remain. He says, no, it does not matter how far the distance is. In the remote places that they live, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is we know is that there will always be a people of the truth. And that we know that the people of the truth are one group. They are not what? Plural. As you'll find that some of the Muslims out there that say this. They'll say that the truth is what? Plural. Rather the truth is only one. Due to the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu talked about all the different deviant sects. And talking about how they're all in the hellfire except one. Which is a clear indication that the truth is what? Is one. So it says a ta'ifa wahida. That they'll be victorious upon the truth, and no one will harm them who lets them down or leaves them or abandons them or opposes them until the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes. Taib. Some people say that the Ta'ifat al Mansura was asked the question that they're al Hadith. Is this correct? To say that they're al Hadith. So listen to what he says in regards to this answer. We'll just read it quick. 
He says it's not correct in all cases in the sense of the meaning of the word. Just listen. Just listen. Just listen. He said we have to give details. Just listen. For what is meant by al-hadith al-mustalah alayh, meaning the word al-hadith, which the people hadith, in which what has been agreed upon, that is people that take the hadith of the Prophet sallam, as far as in the terminology or the science of it, and that's it. Meaning, the people are the science of hadith, basically he's saying. Whereas now we have removed the, people, the scholars of jurisprudence or the, or the scholars of tafsir, or anything that resembles that, then that's incorrect because they're also considered the people of hadith. The scholars of jurisprudence are also the people of hadith. And the scholars of tafsir, a lot of them are, if you'll find, if not all of them were people of hadith. As Muhammad Jalil al Tabari was a, was a muhadith and Ibn Kathir. As Ibn Kathir was a muhadith, he was a person of hadith. He was a muhadith. A lot of people think he was a mufassir, and that's it. No, Ibn Kathir was a muhadith, and he was a mufassir. He was both. Rather, he was a havu of all the affairs of the religion. However, a lot of people don't realize that Ibn Kathir was a muhadith and a mufassir, both. Due to the fact that he has a book called, it's called Ba'ith al-Hadith, fi ma'rifat al-Ulum al-Hadith. Ba'ith al-Hadith, al-Hadith is a tremendous works that one will study if he wants to specialize in the field of hadith, which I had the opportunity to study with, with the great, my great Fadil Tilwarid, Sheikh Abdullah al-Bukhari, in which we covered about a third of it. About, maybe, about a third. But anyway, to make a long story short, Al-Ba'ith al-Hadith is a book that was written in the science of hadith. And it was made, it was, it was authored by Ibn Kathir. Because he was a muhaddith and he was a mufassir. The point why we're mentioning this, he's saying if it's intended the people of hadith, meaning the people who just specialize in hadith, then that's not the meaning. He said that's not correct. He's saying when we say people of hadith, meaning those who take their evidences and proofs from kitab and sunnah, which is also included from that, the scholars of fiqh and the scholars of tafsir likewise, then what we mean by that is the people of hadith, then they're also included in that. They're also included in that. So a person should not understand when he's saying here specifically, al-hadith, meaning those who are just specialized in its field, and that's it. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? So al-hadith, the meaning of it here is more comprehensive than what a person might think, but it's just the people who specialize in the field of hadith, and that's not the case. He said that. The meaning of it is the ulama tafsir and the ulama of jurisprudence, meaning the fiqh, that those that scrutinize the text to the point where they build everything based upon the evidences from kitab and sunnah and reality, they are al-hadith. And it's not just the people of hadith, meaning those who specialize in that field only. Rather, it's comprehensive for all of these what? The ulama. Because all of them what? Built what they're upon or what they specialize in upon the authentic sunnah of the Prophet So all of them are considered in actuality what everyone? Al-hadith. Is it clear what I'm saying? Is it clear what I'm saying? طيب. فالمقصود. For what is intended is that everyone that returns their affairs back to the kitab of sunnah, they are the meaning, or that is the meaning of al-hadith. In the general meaning or the general sense. The word, of course. For everyone <clears throat> that now scrutinizes or investigate the text and they built their actions upon the authentic sunnah, they are all included in what, what we just mentioned. طيب. For the Prophet Sallallahu <clears throat> that he mentioned this narration, of course, there will always be a group of my ummah. If you look in the whole hadith, this tremendous hadith, or rather one we can say also alarming hadith, that all these calamities that befall the ummah, from the beginning and the end of the narration, what we've been covering for the past lessons, you'll find that this narration indicates how strangeness will become. How the severity of strangers will become in the ummah, meaning those who cling to what is correct, how there will be so many calamities that will befall the ummah 
until, as they say, the strangeness will become what? Severe. Well, amongst the people in regards to what? All these different calamities that were mentioned in the hadith of what will take place. And that was back then, and what will we say? Or how we would say? Will be in comparison to what your father, Al Ilm, in the past thought they were in a, in a stage or in a time of strangeness. Then what would they say now? Or we say in these days and times of what? We see of what is taking place around us of so much corruption and so much uh, evil and wickedness that we see. And so many various types and, and, and all of its doors of fitna are open to the people to the point where the doors of fitna are open in our mere pockets, what we carry around as methods or tools, where the doors of fitna are even in our pockets with these smartphones and social media. So you find here, Ma'ash al that this, this particular narration is tremendous. But the Prophet wanted to, know, wanted to establish that there will be a group of his ummah that will always exist. Why? There has, it necessitates, and this is very important, that there always has to be a group of the ummah that will remain on the earth. Why? In order for the proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be established. So there will always be someone or a group or number that are upon the, the correct understanding and methodology. In order for the hujjah of Allah or the evidence or the proof of Allah to be established on, upon the people in the earth. So there will always have to be someone from the people of the truth or a group or number of them remaining. All the up until the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? <coughs> طيب, let's get to the, the, the Masail. Who wants to read the first one? Read the first one for me. Uh, For me, uh, Bilal. Raise your voice, raise your voice. Type the explanation of the ayah of the Nisa. Huh? What is it, everyone? You got to look to the beginning of the part of, the, of the, uh, your book. Do you not see those who have been given a portion of the book? Those who believe in Egypt and the Taghut. Who was talking about who? The Jews and the Christians. Well, preferably here, it was talking about, it was revealed concerning the Jews. As the Jews, they used to believe in taking their affairs back to Egypt. We said back, the demeanor of Egypt is what, everyone? The magicians, fortune tellers, the soothsayers, the fortune tellers, and people, people who practice magic, that they were heavily into that. And still to this day, a lot of them still are. Especially that I hear now what is on the rise, especially in the west side of California. That they said witchcraft and now magic is, is on the rise. The practice of witchcraft and magic is on the rise. Especially on the west, on the west coast. So in the regards you'll find that the people of the book they were, they used to partake in this affair. And from the affairs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about them, that they used to indulge in what? Al-Jibt, which is the practice of magic and sorcery. That was from the ways of what? The people of the book. And they also used to believe in a taqut. What did we say from last class? What was the meaning of the ayah? Why did the great imam put this in the chapter as a evidence or reference? Why? To follow the Abdullah. Jayu. Because we said that this ayat are talking about the Jews and the Christians. And we know from, this te- from the other text that has been authentically reported that this ummah will follow the Jews and the Christians. And we, how many have we heard and seen that there are Muslims partaking in magic and partaking in the affairs of the Jews and the Christians as far as in certain beliefs from or out of, excuse me, resembling them. So that's the reason why he put it in the chapter. Is it not, is it not that what we see taking place around us? Don't we see Muslims out there indulging in magic? And the Muslims out there that believe in the Tawhut. There's Muslims out there that believe in the Tawhut. There's Muslims out from the Tawahid, from the practice of democracy, and the practice of liberalism, and the practice of communism. All these are Tawahid, Tawhut. The system, systems that are what? Tawhutiyah. They're all type of 
tawahid that you'll find that have crept in the Muslim lands and they're practicing it and they rather you'll find that some of them even say that their system is better than the Sharia. As you'll find the use of al-Qardawi that he mentioned is said, ana ufadilu al-hurriya ala sharia You'll find that he said that I prefer li being liberated or liberalist or, or being free or liberated over Sharia, over the Kitab al Sunnah. As you'll find, that was a statement of Yusuf al Qardawi. That was from one of his statements. That I prefer Hurriya, liberation, or the people to have Hurriya to the just to be, have freedom, or so called liberated or liberation over the Kitab al Sunnah. Just a statement to show why I prefer just if you want to just say in general words that I or if you want to say in other words, I prefer Tahut over what Allah and His Messenger have revealed. You understand what I'm saying, everyone? Five, you're also making heard him saying statements that if someone so of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to run in a race for being elected, that even Allah himself wouldn't get as many votes as this particular person. Or I think it was a Jew. No, he said that. It was years ago. He was in Qardawi. Now Allah wouldn't even attain or have these number of votes. And then you'll find that millions of people follow Yusuf al Qardawi. Millions. And this is his state. The state of the height of ignorance. Yusuf al Qardawi. As the Imam Muqbil has a lecture, it's called. It's <laughs> <laughs> As he has a lecture that is called Iskat al Kalb al Awi. Iskat al Kalb al Awi. And people used to say that Sheikh Muqba was, <laughs> was very stern with him. Oh, why could you say that? And now you see the statement of why Sheikh Muqba said what he said about him. He has a lecture that is called Iskat al Kalb al Awi. Muzzling the howling dog. Rahimahullah. <laughs> <laughs> Si or you want to say silencing the howling dog? That was the main. It's cat. Silencing the howling dog. And he was talking about Yusuf al Qadawi. Silencing the how the howling dog. He has a nice, nice refutation against Yusuf al Qadawi. So back then, people couldn't understand. Subhanallah, why is it so, so stern against him? Now you see why. For a person that says this type of speech, no doubt he deserves to be what silenced. You understand everyone? Tayyib. So in this regard, you'll find that the tafsir of this ayah is to show that there will be from this ummah who will want, follow the Jews and the Christians in a lot of their practices, in a lot of their ways. Such as, for example, the celebration of the Prophet Sallallahu birthday. Isn't that not from the ways of the Jews and the Christians? The celebration of the Prophet Sallallahu birthday. Or all different types of practices, for example, in regards to worshiping graves and worshiping the dead and worshiping people who are still alive and giving them rights which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Deserving of as far as in worship. All this is out of resemblance of the Jews and the Christians. So that was the reason why he put it in in this what? In this chapter. Like the next, what does it say? Said the tafsir ayat al maida. Tafsir ayat al maida. Taib, the tafsir ayat al maida. Same thing what we talked about. The prophet, there's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the Jews and the Christians. You know, be from this ummah who will do likewise. Taib, what's the third? The explanation of the ayah, which is the surat al kaf. Which is the surat al kaf. There's also a recitation Same thing That those who say or They say those who Have dominated And dominated over their affair Meaning they were given power over them Meaning the righteous That we would take upon them a masjid <coughs> As we talked about the Ayah Surat Al-Kahf, what took place amongst those youth, what took place amongst those youth, that after they died, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made as a sign for the creation, when they died, the people after them, 
we said that one of the meanings of the ayah, one of the meanings of what? That the leaders came and they wanted or they forced a group of people to take the place where the youth died as a masjid, to build upon their grave a masjid due to the power or the overpowerment of the rulers. The rulers came and forced them to take them as a what? To take and build a masjid upon a grave where they died. Which is the ayah in Surah Al-Kahf. We talked about this last class, didn't we? Not last class, but a couple of classes ago. He said, فَقَالَ الَّذِينَ غَلَبُوا عَلَىٰ أَمْرِهِمْ That they affirmed that they became where they became overpowered or dominated by those who were in charge. Meaning from the rulers at that particular time. طيب, at the end of the day, we said that Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab said the same thing of what took place then, of course with them, is exactly what will take place with this ummah, out of resembling them. There will be from amongst the Muslims who will take their righteous and build masajid upon their graves. And the same thing that happened with them, with the righteous who passed away, and they built masajid upon, or places of worship upon their graves, the same thing will happen to this ummah. And it has happened. Everything that's been mentioned in this chapter took place. Everything. Five. Next one. طيب. It says, ما معنى الإيمان? I was talking about now the next, next uh, matter that's mentioned here. It says the most important of it, ما معنى الإيمان بالجبت والطاغوت? هل هو اعتقاد قلب أو موافقة أصحابها مع بغضها ومعرفة بطنانها? This is very important. This is important here, brothers. It says the most important of the affair, what we discuss, what we're discussing now. What is the meaning of belief in the jibt and the taghut? Is it a belief of the heart or conviction of the heart? Or is it agreeance with its practitioners? I Meaning those who practice it or those who, who, who practice it despite of the person having hatred for it and having knowledge of its invalidity. Five. As for the belief of it with the heart and having the conviction that it's correct, we have no doubt that this is, this is a concern in the eye. Basically, let me, let me make, give a little bit more clarification. If you look in the fourth mas'ala, everyone, this fourth mas'ala is talking about, basically, it returns back to the eye in Surah Nisa. Because the eye in Surah Nisa is talking about what? The belief in what? Egypt in what? Tawhut. طيب. So if we turn back to Surah Al-Nisa or the Ayah Surah Al-Nisa, so we can apply. Well, we can apply. As far as the belief in the heart or the conviction of the heart, no doubt that's applicable to the Ayah. As we know, belief in the Taqut or the belief that it's correct or the belief in the Jibt that it's correct. I also wanted to bring some clarification. In regards to magic, it's a difference between believing in its existence and a belief that is what? That is incorrect, it's invalid, and it's falsehood. It's incumbent upon the Muslims to believe that it exists. Is it clear what I'm saying? That magic does exist. Is it clear? We believe that magic exists and it can affect someone and it can affect people by the permission of Allah, if Allah wants. Is it clear what I'm saying so far? And it's a difference between the existence of it and the, and the belief that it is what? That it's falsehood and that it is what? Evil and wicked and it's incumbent upon the Muslims to stay away from it. So number one, we believe in the first meaning, without a shadow of a doubt, that we embrace of its existence, that magic exists. And what's so crazy is the fact that we're discussing this, because if you look and flip the page, what's the next chapter? 
<laughs> ah. <laughs> It's as if the imam, he knew what he was doing, he was writing a book. He knew exactly what he was doing. He put everything in order. Five. <laughs> so it's the difference between the existence of magic. So we believe magic what, exists and it can affect people. Due to the fact that we know that the Prophet ﷺ was affected by what? By magic. He was. By the permission of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, we're going to talk about in the difference in which you'll find that there are even Muslims out there that deviated, that either deny this, they say magic does not exist at all, such as the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiya, or the, especially the Mu'tazila. As they don't believe, we're going to talk about in the next chapter, it's going to come that they don't believe that magic exists, that they say there's a logical explanation for everything, so called. Based upon what is apparent, there's a logical expla explanation for why things occur. And they deny the affair of what? Of magic. Is it clear what I'm saying so far? And, so, and then you have the total opposite of the spectrum. For example, people say the Prophet so that means the fact that he maybe he was truly magic that he came with because he was affected by it. Huh. That's why you'll find uh, in rebuttal this ambiguity here. They say even though he was affected by magic it was only in the affair of something that was pertaining to what? To something that he thought that he was doing, but it was not, but he did not do it. But in regards to the revelation of Allah, as I'll talk about, inshallah, gonna, we're going to get into it, that the revelation was protected by Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the revelation. Anything that was pertaining to the affairs of wahi was protected, which I'll discuss, inshallah. That's all going to come. Tayyip. So what is the meaning here? So is it just merely the belief of the heart as far as magic? So we said number one, we established that we believe in, in its, what everyone, existence. So we're not like the Mu'tazila who deny it. Because I'm saying that for a reason. Because there's a deviant sect out there who are named the Mu'tazila, that they deny magic and its existence. They deny it. They reject it. The Mu'tazila and also the Jahmi. We'll talk about that in a minute, in the, in the upcoming chapter. It's going to come. We believe in its existence. However, we believe in, or we believe, excuse me, we believe that magic is wicked and evil. And we're going to speak about, inshallah, that the practice of magic, or its practitioners, are in a state of disbelief, especially if they're practicing the worst form of magic, which is the utilization of the shayateen to do their dirty work. The utilization of the unseen devils to do their dirty work. To harm people. And that a person is in a state of kufr, in a state of disbelief and left the fold of Islam if he utilizes especially this type. Which we'll talk about inshallah. Tayyip. So what about those who agree with those who practice it? Meaning what they do. Even though he says, Ma'abukhdiha, that he might hate it and have knowledge of its invalidity. Fine. Listen to what Ibn Uthaymani says in this regard. Keep, him fo keep on focus the fourth matter. We're still discussing the fourth. I'm going to read it quickly. He says, فَهَذِي يَحْتَاجِ لَتَفْصِيلِ فَإِذَا كَانَ وَافَقَ أَصْحَابَهَا بِنَاءً عَلَىٰ أَنَّهَا الصَّحِيحَةً فَهَذَا كُفْرٌ وَإِن كَانَ وَافَقَ أَصْحَابَهَا وَلَا يَعْتَقِدْ أَنَّهَا الصَّحِيحَةً فَإِن وَلَكَ لَشَّكَ عَلَى خَطِرٍ عَظِيمٍ يَخْشَى أَنْ يُؤَدِّيَ بِهِ الْحَالِ إِلَى الْكُفْرِ وَالْعِيَاذِ بِاللَّهِ As we know, there are people out there, especially from the deviant sects, who allow magicians to come in their masajid and practice it. We know there are certain Muslims out there. طيب, do we say that they disbelieve? Jay, listen, Jay. So this needs details. If a person agrees with his practitioners or those who practice him, based upon the belief that it is correct and that it's valid, we have no doubt this is kufr. They have the belief. I said the i'tiqad. 
It's kufr, disbelief. What you're doing is good. It's a great deed. This is nice. This is, this is excellent. This right here is what? Disbelief. As we know that magic is part of corruption in the earth. Magic is part of corruption in the earth. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited the spread of corruption in this earth after its rectification. And we know that is from the major forms of what? Major forms of polytheism and disbelief. As the Prophet ﷺ even called it from the seven great destructive sins. And from then the message of Allah mentioned what? Magic. All that's going to come inshallah. But any rate, I don't want to lose focus on what we're discussing. However, let's just say now. in Let's just say now. He comes and he agrees with his practitioners. I mean those who practice it. But he does not have the conviction of what they're doing is correct. Oh. See disbelief? He agrees with them. I mean, he's openly showing that what they're doing is correct. But however, they don't have, he doesn't have to believe that what they're doing is something good or something valid or something what? Correct. Here we don't say that they disbelieve. However, they are in a very, very dangerous state. Extremely dangerous. And we, we are afraid that maybe perhaps that this type of way of thinking will lead you down a road to where you are totally leave out the fold of Islam. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Is it clear what I'm saying? So that's written, this affair, like we said, is very important. That's the reason why we want to give some details here, number four. That's what he said. Now, let's read it again, because I want everybody to focus on, on this benefit here. He says, the most important of it, because he's talking about the ayah Surah Nisa. What is the meaning of belief in the Egypt and the Taghut? Is it the, the conviction or the belief of the heart, or is it just merely agreeance of its practitioners? Even though the person might hate it and have knowledge of its invalidity. Ah, so we just gave details in this. But the first one, without a shadow of a doubt, is disbelief. Without a doubt, generally. Is it clear what I'm saying? If you believe and have to believe that that person, what he's doing, of practicing magic and voodoo and all these different types of magic that are out there, or the usage of lines or certain moving certain numbers, or as you see, certain uh, what they came, the games with the Ouija board and all these other satanic type of practices. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? You believe that that's an excellent act and that it's something that is what? Excellent. No doubt that we said that this person is what? He's fell into disbelief. However, if he agrees, let's just say, for example, especially with those Muslims who are ignorant, that bring these magicians inside of their what? Their massage. We don't rush or hasten towards declaring a person to be a disbeliever. However, brothers and sisters, we said, if a person manifests their agreeance with this, even though, like we said, he has the antiqad of its invalidity, and that is what? It's falsehood. He's still in a state of what? He's still in a dangerous state. Is it clear what I'm saying? Because he's still, when one profess or openly uh, professes his agreeance with this type of, a, of condemned affairs, no doubt it's something that's extremely dangerous. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Even though he might have in his heart hatred for it or knowledge of its invalidity. Is it clear? So that's the fourth affair. Is it clear what I'm saying so far, everyone? We're going to get more details in the upcoming chapter. <clears throat> The fifth, read the fifth one for me. You gotta be kidding me. Tafado. No, I'm talking about the time. How fast is it? Read the uh, fifth one for me, Musa. <laughs> Uh, this fifth ayah, verily the, the disbelievers, that they had knowledge, يَعْرِفُونَ كُفْرَهُمْ أَهْدَ سَبِيلًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He said, verily, that the disbelievers, he's talking about the ayah still. He's talking about the ayah that we already read. Uh, let's go back to the ayah. 
It's still talking about the ayah of Tanisa. If you're looking at in your books, everyone, looking at Mus'haf, do you not see to those who have been given a portion of the book that they believe in the Egypt of what Taghut? Look to the end of the ayah. What does it say? Oh, they don't have it in your books. Is it, is it, is it, is it in your books? Yeah, we're still talking about ayah of Tanisa. Huh. Open the Mus'haf, someone who has it. What does it say at the end of the ayah? Huh? Find it quickly. Mm -hmm. ah. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about the last part of this ayah. What does it say? Again, read it for me, Jamar. You find it yet? Read it loud. Just the part. Do you not see that those who be given a portion of the book? Huh? See your books. 51. Ah, so that's what the eye is. So we're still discussing this ayah. So if you want to put right next to your book, this is still concerning sort of Tanisa, write it in your book. Ah, what is it talking about? It's talking about the Yahud. The Jews went to what? To the Kufar from the Quraysh in Mecca. Went to them and told them. And asked them about the opinion of Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just to sum it up, because we got we wanted to finish the chapter. I think it's almost time to call you then. If I'm not mistaken. It comes at 8.30? You want to call, uh, call in Amir? Amir in the office or whatever, Amir out here? Hold <laughs> on. Right, so it's talking about the ayah, which is in Surah An-Nisa. When they went to the Kufa Quraysh, and they was asking concerning Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were giving them certain answers. Until the point where the Yahud, that the Yahud said what they said, until it said right here in your book, it said, In al kufar ya'arifuna kufrahum. It said that the, that the non Muslims they knew, ya'arifuna kufrahum. Oh, no, he's about to call you. Right, let me let him call you there. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. <laughs> So let's go back to the story of what happened, just briefly, so we can go back, so I can, so we can, everybody can have a clear picture. So the, if you look at the last part of the ayah, this ayah was concerning about the Yahud. As we know, when the Prophet ﷺ, when he went to Al Madinah, migrated, and when the strength of the Muslims, when the strength of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the dominance of the Muslims had increased to the point where they had and formed their own dola or their own land, and Islam was becoming strong and powerful. 
And we know, as I discussed in the, in the previous classes, about the three tribes of the Jews. I talked about this. There was three tribes. There was one tribe called Banu Quraidha, and there was another tribe of Yahu called Banu Qaynaqa, and there was another tribe of Yahu called Banu Nadir. There was three tribes of the, of the Yahud in Medina. Banu Qaynaqa, Banu al Quraidha, and Banu Nadir. As I've seen it, when I was in Medina, sad to say, that was with Muhammad bin Hadi 12 years ago. He was in his car, and he was like, this is where the tribes of the Yahud were. were. And he told me all three of the, the, the Yahud, where they were. But at any rate, what happened upon that, when the Prophet ﷺ became dominant in the Sahaba, they went to the Kufar Quraysh in Mecca because they was highly upset. They were highly upset, so they went to Kufar Quraysh. So well, those who were from the heads of the Yahud, who was Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf and Huyay ibn al-Akhtab, and Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf was killed by, Musayl, uh, by Muhammad ibn Maslam. At any rate, I don't know. Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf went to the Kufa Quraysh in order to seek their help against fighting the Prophet ﷺ and the companions. So they took the initiative. So they said to the Kufa Quraysh, or rather the Kufa Quraysh said to them, You are the people of the book. You know truth. You know the truth from falsehood. Clarify to us. Are we more rightly guided or Muhammad? Are we more guided or Muhammad? Is it clear what I'm saying so far? Huh? Is it clear, isn't it clear or not clear? The Yahu came to who? The Kufa Quraysh. The Kufa Quraysh said, there's something I'm going to get to this that's real important. Because it's not just concern, concerning the Yahu. We want to, I want everyone to understand the methodology. Because that's what's important. How do the Muslims fall into this today? Uh, that's what's important. You understand? Because everything that was revealed to what happened and took place is in order for us to avoid, not to do it. Is it clear what I'm saying? Fine. So just listen to the methodology. Let's look to, the, to, the, to what the method that took place. This is what's important. So they went to the Kufa Quraysh and said, you got, or, or we got it, rightly got it. Are we more guided or is Muhammad? So what did the Jews started to say? He started to speak ill about the Prophet ﷺ. Why did the, the Yahud notice that the Kufar Quraysh said, you know the truth from falsehood? So basically, you the Yahud know that Muhammad is truly a prophet and messenger. You already know. You knew his characteristics. You knew everything. You know this. Tayyib, who's more rightly guided? So they started talking and speaking ill and defaming the message of Allah. As it says in the narration, Muhammad is Sunbur, Mabtur, Qata'a Arhamana, to the end of it. The Muhammad is Sunbur. Now he's basically Mabtur. He's cut off from any blessing. He's destroyed and separated our families. Basically, they reversed everything. They say, We're the one who slaughters the animals and we feed the people who come for Hajj, for the pilgrimage, and we give them drink. To the end of it. And we're the ones that connect and keep our family ties. So he basically was now defaming the Prophet Sallallahu And they were talking about what? They were praising the Kufar Quraysh. Until it says in the narration that we're the ones that done, we're the Kufar that have done such and such and all these good deeds. Until the Yahud said in the end, you are the one that is what? Better. And you are properly, you are more guided than Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi now look at to the methodology of it. What's the methodology? What, what we're trying to go with all this? Now let's apply it to what? What Ahl al-Ilm say here. <laughs> so now look at the method. Why does Ahl al-Ilm now they say in this regard? What happened that took place between the Yahud, talking, speaking ill about the Prophet and the Sahaba, right? How is this now applicable to, to, to what takes place with the Muslims today? Huh. You raise your hand, be loud. Tafaddo. No, no, no. How, listen to my question. How did the Muslims fall into this? 
The same thing that the Yahud, Yahud give him a chance. The same thing the Yahud, the Jews fell into the past. How do the Muslims fall into the same thing of today? What, 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 how? What do they do? What do they, what do they do? What do they say? You use your hands for him. Oh, he looked like he went like this and he backed out. Nah. Ho, oh, you, you, you raise your hands for him. Father Umar. Not necessarily. It doesn't have to do with education. Not necessarily. Tafadal astaghfirullah to me. I was about to call Esif. Tafadal Kashif. I was about to call Esif as a real Nova. Kashif. That's where I'm getting it at. Taking them as confidants to the point where they start to go to them, praise them. And then he started to discredit Islam, apologize, compromise, to the end of it. Control the kufar. And if you want to say, for lack of better words, to boot lick them. Boot lick them. Is it clear what I'm saying? Tayyib. You'll find that other him say that this statement here, that you guys are more rightly guided than those people. Who want to practice key tab and sunnah with the sharia? No, you are guided. You properly guided. You're more guided than them. Oh, they're just people that uh, they still want to practice some old message that's only for ancient times. You are the ones that are rightly guided. You are the ones that we respect and we honor, we revere to the end of it. Is it clear what I'm saying? This type of statement you'll find al ilm say, habl qaw kufa wa ridda. This is something that is disbelief. In his apostation. It's Ridda. Whoever claims that the disbeliever and the kuffar, Aladina Yarraf Kufruhum, in which is known their disbelief, that there's more rightly guided or is, is better guided in their path or their methodology than the believers, that person has left the fold of Islam. He's kafir. He's left the fold of Islam. Kafir. Due to the fact that he gave precedence to disbelief over what? Over faith. So that's the methodology, the method. That's what I want everyone to be aware of, is the methodology. Because that's really important. Very, very important. Because you'll find a lot of the Muslims that are falling into this in so many ways. Especially those from the deviant sex, or the Muslims, who control compromise to the end of it. In order to what? They'll even express, is even I just heard even uh, in Delaware here, is even I think in uh, the... Um, Oh, stuff of the Lord, too, really. our, our brother um, Fahd, he even told me. He said, what's so strange is they talk about some, the Muslims are, or the, or the, or from the Ikhwanis, that you know the Jews this and the Jews that, and here you have their flag in the masjid. Or you'll have something like a flag, he said they had something participating, praising them and inviting them to, their, to iftar, inviting the non-Muslim to make iftar with them or pray with them and they can pray beside you and having their flag. Huh. Oh. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of, and I'm not sure if it's Masjid Ibrahim. It's a certain message. I just want to make sure so I can have my facts straight. It is Masjid Ibrahim? Every Ramadan. Interfaith uh, Sahur or Interfaith Iftar. All those affairs. And you'll find if they say to them, all oh, those people that want, they are, you know, those people that stay in the Masjid, they want to make themselves introverted. Separated. Oh, I don't believe them. They're people. They're not rightly guided. And now you invited them to your masjid, and now you're you're expressing your gratitude, and we 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 honor, revere you, and we we highly respect the fact that you came and visited us today. To the end of it, these affairs are very very dangerous. Very dangerous. See, now you gave precedence to disbelief, like we said in this particular context of what we're talking about. This is what happened with the uh, Yahud. Why? Because the Yahud knew the truth. They knew what was correct. And they knew that the Prophet ﷺ was upon, was upon the truth. They knew that. They had it in their books. It was clear. The reason why they rejected it was based upon what? Because they just wanted the last and final messenger to, to be from amongst them. That's all. But they believed that he was what? The prophet, final prophet and messenger. They believed they had no shadow of a doubt that he was the last prophet and messenger. 
but out of envy and jealousy that they wanted it to be from them, they rejected the truth. That same methodology even applies to even some of our people here, whether it be black or white or Arab or not Arab, it doesn't matter. Well, for example, African Americans say, if, if it's not African American speaking, I'm not listening, I'm not accepting it. Or African, because Africans are prejudiced too. Absolutely, I mean, I mean, we all said it simultaneously. Absolutely. No, it's nothing against you. Africans are prejudiced against, Af against African Americans. You think that they lo love you, but they're one of the most prejudiced people that look down on you. What? They don't look at you like anything. You go to Africa, they might treat you worse. You understand? So now they come and say, well, you're African American, I'm not accepting the truth from you. Who are you? It happens. Based upon one's skin color, we reject the message. Same thing, same ideology. Or you'll find it out of the, some of the out of, or you're, you're African American, you know, what you say, it doesn't really matter to us. Or even you'll find black people the same thing. Well, you're Arab, I don't have any respect for you. All these are ideologies of what happened with the people of the past, which was ways in which even the Prophet clarified, or excuse me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear in his book or reasons of why people rejected the truth and as a result of it they became from the inhabitants of hell. Because they rejected the truth based upon the fact that it came from someone they didn't like. Or they came or out of jealousy that it wasn't from their people that came with the truth. You understand what I'm saying everyone? All these are ideologies of the people of what? Of Jahiliya. Of the ways of, of uh, pre-Islamic ignorance. And we know that anything is connected with the word Jahiliya is connected with it. Know for sure it's something that's highly condemned and it was from the ways of those who are from the inhabitants of the hellfire. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Is it clear? Fight. Number seven. Oh, oh, software. Six. Six. Huh? Who wants to read it? Hey, Tafan, I'm sorry, Amir. <laughs> Is it Abu Sa'id or Abu Sa'id? Abu Sa'id. Now, this must be a typo. I don't have a typo in my book. Abu Sa'id al Khudri, you're right. I think that's clear. That no doubt that it will be from this ummah, just as has been established in the hadith of Sa'id Khudri, there will be people who will do, indulge in these matters. I think that's clear. Seventh, number seven. Ah, a tasrih, that this will take place. Firstly, the Prophet Sallallahu frankly, Indicating that this will, this will what everyone? It will, it will take place. It will occur. A tasrih bi wuqu'iha. That it will what? It will frankly, or him being frank, that this will what? Occur. A'ni ibadat al-awthan fi hadihi al-ummah. The worship of idols in this ummah. And it will happen with a lot of people, it says, fi jumu'in kathira. With a lot of people of this ummah will fall into idol worship. Uh, worshiping idols. Which is an indication of, as we talked about a couple of minutes ago, ishtidad al ghurba Being a stranger, meaning people whose upon was correct, will become, will become what? Severe. There'll be a lot of darkness, even amongst those who say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And you compare it to the one who's upon what is correct, in comparison to what? A lot of the majority, what they're doing, you'll find that that person is considered gharib. It's a strange individual. Father. Hmm? Number eight. Father. That's a lot of Messiah. I didn't even realize it was that many. Father. Ah, Jayid. He said, what is most strange, those who will emerge are people who will claim prophethood. Khuruj may nubuwa. Who will emerge with emergence of those who will claim prophethood. And then he gave a name, the great Imam, Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab. 
نساء المختار المختار هو سي تو با المختار ابن ابي عبيده الثقفي المختار ابن ابي عبيده الثقفي the liar who the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم called him a kidhab prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم called him a kidhab in a narration which is a sahih muslim the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says سيخرج من ثقيف كذاب ومبير as um salama I think it was Um Salama from what I remember in Ibn Kathir we mentioned Bidai when he hired that Um Salama was threatened by Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi. He threatened her. I think it was Um Salama, if I'm not mistaken. He says, If you will come to me, I'll get you to be dragged, dragged by your forelock or your head. That's how oppressive he was. <sighs> so they gave her came to her house, knocked on the door. The point of the matter of the story is because I don't want to get too sidetracked. She said that the Prophet ﷺ conveyed to me, he says, سَيَخْرُجُ مِنْ ثَقِيفٍ كَذَّابٌ وَمُبِيرٌ أَمَّا كَذَّابٌ فَقَدْ رَأَيْنَا وَأَمَّا مُبِيرٌ فَلَا إِخَالُكَ إِلَّا إِيَّا As it says in the narration. The Prophet ﷺ, she said, when, she, when, it, when, it, when, it was, when he came to our house, and I think it was some of the uh, delegates that carried out his orders, came to our house, and she said, Ask for, uh, I heard the Messenger of Allah say this hadith that there will emerge from thaqif a liar and a one who loves to shed blood due to adana shubha, do any type of what, what he sees as, a, as a, some type of, of, uh, of, of you want to say, some type of justifiable cause to kill someone, he'll do it. Easy. Jayat. So the Prophet ﷺ, she said, I heard from the Messenger of Allah's narration. Now listen to what she said. She says, as for the liar, who is she talking about? Mukhtar ibn Abi Ubaid. فَقَدْ رَأَيْنَا We've seen him. فَقَدْ رَأَيْنَا And if you look to the history of Mukhtar ibn Abi Ubaid, he caused a lot of corruption. Whew. A lot of corruption and used a lot of deceit. To propagate his falsehood. A lot of deceit. Mukhtar Abi Ubaid. So notice that it says in the narration, For as for the liar, we've seen him. Mukhtar Abi Ubaid. So that was the Prophet said that he was a what? He's a liar. Why? Because he predicted, or because he claimed that he was a what? Prophet. When Hajjaj Abu Yusuf al Thaqafi threatened her, she said, For ask for it when the Prophet said, The one who likes to shed. Blood of a person, فَلَا إِخَالُكَ إِلَّا إِيَا For I do not think they accept that you are the one who he was talking about. Why? Because Mukhtar Abi Ubaid was what? Thaqafi. Because the Prophet said in the narration that will emerge from where? Thaqif. So Mukhtar Abi Ubaid was what? Thaqafi. And Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf was also what? Thaqafi. So both of them what? Applied to what the Messenger of Allah said. The point of the matter in the narration, it says that the Prophet ﷺ said about him that he was a what? Kedhab. Liar. He was a liar. He was going to claim prophethood and he was a what? He was a liar. So notice it says in the, in the benefit, right everyone? مثل مختار بعبيد مع تكلمه Now listen to the, what, the words that the great Imam is mentioning here. Because I want everyone to be very, very uh, attentive. It says, مختار بعبيد even though this was the case, he uttered the shahada. Ma'atakallumihi bishahadatayn. Uttering the two testimonies, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Subhanallah. Muhammad Rasulullah, that would necessitate you would have to say mukhtar. <laughs> Him uttering the shahadatayn, even though he was what? Ma'atasrihu bi'annahu mahadi al-ummah. And he was also, he, he clearly and frankly professed that he was from this ummah. Why? In despite of that, there was it the truth. And that the Qur'an was the haqq. And that the Qur'an is the truth. Why do you think that the great imam is mentioning this? Why? Why do you think he's choosing these words? <laughs> Why? Tafadah. That too. That there will be people who will come. Huh? 
That's true. That's true. It's a refutation. To give you awareness that there's going to be people that are misguided and there are people who are dangerous and they utter the shahada. So now and that is a clear indication that anyone, that not everyone that says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is upon was correct. Clear indication. You understand? Clear indication. No matter, even though they, they, they profess and they now verbally utter clearly, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, doesn't matter. A person that claims prophethood, he's upon what? Falsehood. Falsehood, and he's also left the vote of Islam. As we talked about before, not only the person that says this, the people who follow him in that, all of it is in a state of what? Disbelief. This we'll talk about inshallah. So there's people out there that says that the message of Allah is the haq, and that the Quran is the truth. And despite of that, like we said, there are people out there who are misguided even though they make this claim. So not everybody that says they're Muslim and says La ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah and they tell you to their face I'm Muslim, I truly believe this, that does not mean that they're rightly what? Guided. And that they are also upon what is what? What is correct. Is it clear what I'm saying everyone? Clear indication. Taib. So notice it says like what? It says in the, uh, it says here, وَفِيهِ أَنَّ Muhammad خَاتُمَ nabiyin. The Prophet ﷺ is the seal of our prophets. And that is mentioned in the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet. It's mentioned in the book of Allah, I'm about to stop now. And it's mentioned in the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet. That the Prophet even said that himself that I'm the seal of all prophets, there's no prophet after me. And the Khatim al Nabiyin, La Nabiya Ba'ti, there is no prophet after me. We already discussed the details in that from last class, right everyone? We discussed that about what happened with Jesus the Son of Mary. And, and a person might try to utilize that to say, no, Jesus the Son of Mary will return. We already gave details and an answer to that, right? Right, Suhail? Tayyib. <laughs> what does the last part say? هَذَا يُصَدِّقُ فِي هَذَا كُلِّهِ مَعَ الْتَضَادِ الْوَاضِحِ وَقَدْ خَرَجَ الْمُخْتَارِ فِي آخِرِ عَصِ السَّحَامَةِ وَتَبِعَهُ فِي آمٌ كَثِيرًا Allah subhanallah al He says, in despite of this, all of what we just mentioned, which is a clear indication, التضاد الواضح of what has now took place, of what a person would think, that despite of, a person have a knowledge of certain affairs and of clarity in regards to who is truly the prophet and who is a false prophet. Verily Mukhtar ibn Abi Ubaid that he emerged in the last in the last time of the Sahaba and a lot of people followed him. Uh, we also talked about right before the message of Allah وسلم, right before he died when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, right before his death, alayhi salatu wasalam, we talked about the false prophets that emerged, who were what? Musaylam al kithab and Aswad al-Ansi, who were two false people who claimed prophethood. This happened while the Prophet وسلم, was alive. And, a lot, and people followed them. People followed them. In Yemen, where Aswad al-Ansi was located, in Yemen. And al-Yamamah, not Yemen, Yamamah, was where? Musaylam al-Kithab. If you look to the history, what Ibn Kathir mentioned, there was a lot of people that was affected by these, by these two false prophets. A lot of people were, were affected. A lot of people were affected. Which is to let you know that even though that the truth is there and it's still amongst us, Allah still guides whom He wills. Allah can guide whom He wills and He can misguide whom He wills. For Verity, during that time, there was a lot, the, the, the truth, the Prophet ﷺ was still alive. But it was towards His death, And there's people that what? Believed in these false prophets. Due to their, 
corruptive, embellished speech that they were given, followed them, and a lot of corruption, what? Came as a result of it. To the point where, if you look, look to some of the narrations, where Abu Bakr the Siddiq, when he left to fight Musaylama al Kithab, Musaylama the liar, in Yamama, there was a lot of bloodshed. There was a lot of people who were killed when they fought him, when they fought Musaylama al Kithab, to let you know how many people were affected. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Because as we know, Abu Bakr fought who? He fought two types of people. With the people who are either murtadin, who apostated. Like we talked about last class, what do you mean apostated? Why? Because they follow these people who claim prophethood. That's why they were considered apostate. From different areas and different countries, uh, excuse me, different areas, from different areas, that some of them have followed these false prophets until the Sahaba, claim, that the Sahaba, their position was that they apostated. It was their position. Abu Bakr and the Sahaba clearly took the position that those who followed them apostated. That's why if you look in the, in the history, what Ibn Kathir mentioned, where Abu Bakr set out to fight two types of people mainly who were what? Apostates who followed the false prophets and those who what? Who misinterpreted that zakat was only during the time of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that was it. But other than that, they did not have the what? They did not have to get zakat. So Abu Bakr went out and fought what? Both of them. Until you'll find that even Aisha said that there, if it wasn't something of, a, of an affair that was more heavy upon the mountains, which Aisha mentioned. She said of what my father had to carry out, she said that, was, that an affair that was more heavy than what had took place due to the fact that a lot of the Qaba'il al-Arab of what had happened when they apostated because of them following these false prophets. To let you know how the, the magnitude of fitna that was taking place when the Messenger of Allah was about to die and after he died, alayhi salatu wasalam. So Abu Bakr basically put everything by the father of Allah first and then the great, uh, and the great, or the greatness of Abu Bakr returned everything back to where it was supposed to be. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? But if you look to the history of it, it was a lot of fitna to the point where Abu Bakr, as it says, the battle that took place between Musaylam and Kithab, that it was a tremendous fight. There was a lot of people that was killed, even from the Qur'a, for those who recited the Qur'an, a lot of them were killed. And I think if I'm not mistaken, it said a number of them were about five. No, 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 no. That was another, another, that was Tatar. That was the Mongolians. The Mongolians killed 500 scholars. But as far as what took place, there was a lot of Qur'a, recites of the Qur'an, that were killed due to that battle. He didn't say the number. But at any rate, just to make the long story short, what is this saying here in this, particular, this last benefit, and we'll stop because we're going to pray. That even though this took place, a lot of people were misguided. A lot of people. To let you know that why? That the guidance and the stability, that it only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That a person can know the truth, but the ultimately the stability in one's heart comes from Allah. A person can even have knowledge of a certain affair. But if Allah to with the does it grant one stability in his heart, he still can go straight. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? I know I've seen people who had have been granted some type of knowledge. I've seen it with my own eyes. Still to this day, I've seen it, still seeing it to this day. I've seen it in the past, in the 90s, and I'm still seeing it to this day. People who have been given ilm, and they, they have now left off and became misguided and deviated. It was given some type of ilm. I've seen it. So many. So even myself, I, I might see a person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might have granted them some intelligence, or granted them some type of memorization. Or granted them some type of uh, some type of understanding in certain affairs, but those who have experience in Dawa, we still look and we still watch and we still have concern because we've seen so many people who have been given given understanding, given a good memory. I've seen people who had books, things memorized, blew me, blew your mind how much you had memorized of Hadith and 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 all the different narrations they can recall, and they still deviated. I've seen it. 
So I'm not impressed when a person comes and they have all this high intelligence. It's, it, it's good to a certain extent. But ultimately, we want to see what will be your bow when years come with fitting a hit, how you will stand firm. Because that's when you earn your stripes. You earn your, your stripes when fitting a hits, bang, and they see your position. That's when we see your stripes. That's how you truly earn your stripes. Not the fact that you have this type of memory or that you have this type of understanding or this high level of understanding and that you have all these narrations memorized or that you can recall this narration off the top of your head or that you can do this or that you're proficient in translation or that you're proficient in the Quran and the recita uh, recitation of it. All these affairs, brothers and sisters, those who have experience in Dawah, they're not, they're not, uh, we're not amazed by that to a certain extent, but we're not truly amazed by those certain affairs. When we see that, we encourage one, and we keep them to be what? To be steadfast and to, to, to learn and to enhance their skills. But ultimately, what, what, really is, what really is respectable and what merely shows respect for a person is while all the fitna that has drawn took place throughout the years, and they still firm throughout all of them. And you haven't been knocked down yet. That is what truly earns respect. <laughs> That's how you get respect. Fitna come, the wave hits, you're still standing firm. Is it clear? And you might not have that much memory. And you might not have memorized much. And you might not have read as much. But that little bit of knowledge that you didn't understand, Allah blessed you in it and gave you tawfiq in it. And made it a reason for you still being what? Firm and stable upon what is correct. Even though you might not have that much memorized. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Huh? Is it clear what I'm saying, Musa? Say wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it clear what I'm saying? Like I said, brothers and sisters, I've seen it with my own eyes. People who have narrations, narrows, and this memorized, that memorized, and they have went astray. I've seen it. It's a scary affair. And it also taught those outside looking in from those who had some type of knowledge and they went still went astray as a result of it, that knowledge is not a guaranteed protection from you going astray. It's not. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? I've seen so many people have gone astray these days, especially these days. From the people from the 90s all the way up to now. People are falling like dominoes left and right, especially these days. I see it, I, and I still keep seeing it. And it's getting worse. So these, that, that, this last thing I'm gonna leave on is to show what everyone. Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab is basically Confirming exactly what we're saying now. He said, he said that this person here, that he was from this ummah, that the message of Allah, he, was the, he, he professed that he was the truth, that the Quran was the truth, and that Muhammad is the, is the seal of our prophets. And despite of all of that, Kharaj al Mukhtar ibn, ibn Ubaid, he came in the last time of the Sahaba, and a lot of people followed him. During the last time of the Sahaba, they were close to people who are upon the truth, who are the Sahaba, who are the greatest of those who had the truth. In despite of that, people still left off the truth. People who what? Deviated, not only deviated, but they what? Apostated. Is it clear, everyone? So I will stop here, inshallah. I wanted to finish this before the Salat. Well, that is what it is. So I will stop here. Any questions about the lesson? Tafadah. Khadalahum. I said it. Khadalahum means to let down, to, 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 to abandon, to abandon, let down, to, to let you down, to not give you aid when you need it. That's all the meaning of, of the word khudlan. Those the apostate, the people who apostated, and the people who are they call man zika, the people who held back paying zika. They help to follow. Huh? Mm 
Absolutely. Absolutely. The practice of magic is belief in a Tarut in Egypt. Hold on. Say it again. I can't hear you, sir. Hypnotism should not be done. I'll tell you about it. I'll give you more details about it later. It shouldn't be done. Hypnotizing or practice hypnotism should not be done. It should not be done. It shouldn't be done. I'll give you some evidence on it later. And we'll probably when the chapter we'll talks about magic, I'll probably talk about hypnotism. Hypnotism should not be done. It should not be done. I'll give you the details when we come to chapter. Let's follow. That's what Satan would that. That's him. That's him. Yeah, wabar, yeah, wabar. Naqi naqeen, kevin naqi naqeen. It's something crazy you said. He tried to bring some of the Quran. And then Allah humiliated him. <laughs> Anything else? Ta'i was. Ta'i was sallallahu sallam baraka ayin nabi na muhammad wa ala adu sahbihi. Subhanakallahu bihamdak. Shalu la ilahi la antistakhrika wa tabi ilaykik.